I'm Jeff, born and raised in Joliet. I'm a graduate student at St. Meinrad School of Theology with a degree in philosophy from Conception Seminary College. God willing, after a long and winding journey in just a couple years, I hope to be ordained a deacon and later a priest for our local church, the Diocese of Joliet. In many ways, you could say I came into this world the least likely candidate for the priesthood, and that as I moved into adulthood, I did just about everything in my power to make myself an even less likely candidate. I came into full communion with the Catholic Church when I was 18, and even then I could sense something like a calling. Sometimes this mysterious sense was so strong that I even took serious steps to pursue a vocation, even though I was young and as a new Catholic immature in the faith. Inevitably, though, I would always snap back to what I thought was reality. You see, we're all products of our time, products of our culture. In many ways, we're living in the best place at the best time in all of history. But no culture is perfect. And the downside of this postmodern Western culture of ours is that we are deeply steeped in a philosophy of materialism, individualism, even nihilism. And the notion of anything truly meaningful is so frequently mocked by popular culture as absurd that we almost can't help but buy into it. As a young adult, then, I would start to think about the idea of a calling to the priesthood, and then something inside me would say, You have got to be kidding me. Surely there is less to life than this. It's not that I was such a bad guy. I wasn't out at night pistol-whipping old ladies or invading Poland. But if I was truly called to anything, it seemed it was to eating frozen pizzas and watching Mori Povich. All this talk of divine calling just didn't make any sense. Just let me hang out with the guys and talk to the ladies, in theory anyway. And if a winning lottery ticket or international rock and roll superstardom or Natalie Portman with an engagement ring wanted to knock on my door, that's great. They knew where to find me, eating frozen pizzas and watching Mori Povich. Let the theologians and philosophers deal with the big questions and let me live my distracted life. This youthful drifting this repulsion at the very idea of the truly meaningful, this cognitive dissonance when we hear the Lord's invitation through the prophet Isaiah this morning to rise up in splendor, this is one of the most common yet most self-destructive, dehumanizing symptoms of our postmodern world. How many of us have felt lost when struggling to choose a career? How many of us have cowered in fear and loneliness rather than commit to a meaningful relationship? How many of us have critically injured or destroyed relationships out of fear of really giving of ourselves, or through dishonesty or infidelity? How many of us have often said we'd like to deepen our relationship with God, or get more involved with the church, or give of our time, talent, and treasure in helping the poor and the oppressed, only to shrug it off as it fails to materialize? The problem is not that we are a particularly evil people living in particularly evil times. In truth, there's much about this day and age with its unprecedented awakening to human dignity and equality and commitment to social justice that's to be celebrated with gratitude. No, the problem is we have all too often lost the ability to see things as they are. In Luke chapter 11, our Lord says to us, Your eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if it is not healthy, your whole body is full of darkness. Therefore consider whether the light within you is not darkness. In this one of our Lord's shortest parables can be found the most profound insight into the human condition. What we all need is to learn to see. Human personhood is an adventure. But in order to live out that adventure meaningfully and well, what we need is precisely this, an epiphany. Jesus was who he was before the Magi or Herod or the crowds at his baptism or the wedding guests at Cana ever knew it. Yet until he revealed himself to them, until they learned how to truly see him, as far as they were concerned, he might as well be just another infant or just another dude. We, men and women, are created in the image and likeness of God, as Genesis tells us, 
partakers in the very nature of God himself, as Second Peter tells us. Yet until we've had our epiphany, until we've learned how to see things as they truly are, we might as well not be. If we're just isolated, lonely individuals, a random collection of cells with no greater purpose, cursed with an illusion of self-awareness, then frozen pizza and Mori Povich is as good a way to spend our lives as any other. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. Our Lord Jesus calls us to something more, something greater. On this great feast of Epiphany, we celebrate Christ making himself known to the world. And why? Why did he come here, share our human condition, and suffer the worst our loveless cruelty has to offer? In John chapter 10 and verse 10, he answers that question. He says to us, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. To have life and have it more abundantly. Get this. To be more alive than alive. Now, how is that possible? We must come to understand that our very existence as men and women is a gift of participation in the existence of God himself. Our existence is a gift because God freely chose to share himself with us. But our existence is not just a gift. It is also gift itself. St. Paul tells us that we are many parts but all one body. A truly flourishing human life is one lived with an awareness that we are all in this together, that by giving of ourselves in love to one another, we become most truly what we are. Every man and woman can rightly look in the mirror and say that everything in this universe, the furthest star, the earth, the whole of human history, it is all there for me. Everything that is except for myself. Because that is for everyone else. So what is a vocation? It is nothing other than the way God has chosen for every one of us to most effectively be a gift, to most ideally love one another, to be an epiphany, an image of God to the people around us. In the scriptures we hear some incredible stories of God empowering people for their mission, but no matter how amazing their gifts were, the saints were never empowered for themselves. When God gave Moses the power to part the sea of reeds, it wasn't for him so that he could break world travel speed records. No, it was so that he could lead God's people to freedom. When God preserved the Virgin Mary from the stain of original sin, it wasn't for her, so she could save time on going to confession. No, it was so she could effectively be a mother for God's people. So it is with us. It's true that Christian life is one of continuing conversion, that we often miss the mark, we behave selfishly and without gratitude. And we must continue to allow the grace of Christ to work in us and bring us ever closer to Him. It may be that some of us have really let things slip and must make a radical conversion to get ourselves back on track. For most of us, however, I'm confident that living our vocation more fully is less about making major changes in our lives and more about epiphany about learning how to see. We might be tempted to say, I'd like to get closer to God, but I have to work 60 hours a week to support my family and run my kids to 20 different extracurricular activities. Or I'd like to get closer to God, but I have one project after another due. Or all my time is spent taking care of my sick grandfather. Or whatever it is we happen to have on our plates. The truth is, if we just open our eyes, we'll see that it is precisely in and through these seemingly ordinary, everyday things that we encounter God and are called to share His love with the people around us by giving of ourselves for the good of the other, always seeking to cultivate a spirit of gratitude and of joy. Whatever our ultimate vocation is, God has called us to be where we are right now in this moment and to be His epiphany in our relationships, in our work, and especially in the sacred vocations of spouses and parents. We are the presence of God. God doesn't abandon us to teeter helplessly at the edge of glory, hanging on to this or that moment of intensity. He invites us to let go of the edge, to take the plunge, to dive into His infinite love, and thus flourish in truly meaningful lives. That's what it means to be Christians. The word means little Christs, 
And with St. Leo, I invite you, Christians, know your dignity. In order that the Church can better live out her mission of being a royal priestly people, of being the bridge between God and the world, the Lord calls some people to work full-time in service of the people of God. There are an ever-growing number of opportunities for professional lay ministry, all of which contribute wonderfully to the building up of the body of Christ. Some men and women answer the call to enter religious communities, dedicating their lives to particular ways of serving the church according to the varied charisms of those communities. Others are called to preach the gospel, celebrate the sacraments, and nurture the life of the parish community as deacons and priests. When thinking about such a calling, it can seem overwhelming. It can seem absurd. We're likely to say, surely there's a mistake. How could I possibly be worthy of this? As Bishop Joseph Imish told me many years ago, and I wish I'd listened to him then, he doesn't make mistakes. Nobody's worthy of this calling. How arrogant would someone have to be to look at what ministry is all about? to look at the call to be Christ to his people and say, yep, that's for me. I'm your guy. But it's not about you and me. God, it's often said, does not call the equipped. He equips the called. Don't hesitate to speak with a priest about the possibility of pursuing a religious vocation. Or if you're not quite ready for that, you can visit our vocation office's website, www.vocations.com. And there you'll find information and guidance as you begin to explore the possibility and begin your journey toward discerning a vocation. As for me, it's been a long journey, but one full of blessing, full of grace, and most importantly, full of the divine mercy. This afternoon, I'm hitting the high-speed highway and returning to seminary to continue my training for priestly ministry. And I ask for your prayers in this endeavor and your prayers for all my brother seminarians also pursuing this call. Thank you.